appreciate everyone being here tonight. Okay, we're going to continue our study tonight on uh, great doctrines of the Bible. In particular, we're going to be looking at uh, God and sacrificial offerings. Is, is there anybody that doesn't have the, that book that was written by uh, Brother Robert Wagner? If you raise your hand, just one, two, three. All right, I'll, I'll talk to the elders. Yeah, I'll talk to the elders and see if there's any extra ones. So we know you want about three or four extra ones. So they may have some. I don't know where they're at. So the lesson series is based on that. Uh, the, the topics are good. I don't, my own personal style is I don't see a need to repeat everything that he has in his lesson when, when you have it at home and you can read. So I'm looking at it as kind of... Uh, expounding on some additional thoughts or, or going into detail on some things that, that he talks about. But when you look at the, uh, the introduction to the book, he, he talks about the, the intent of, of what he writ, wrote about these great doctrines is, to, is so that uh, people can better prepare themselves for the eternal afterlife. And then he notes that, uh, you know, he didn't try to write everything there is to consider on these subjects. And of course, if you did that, then you'd have a book of thousands and thousands of pages. But, but the intent is, is to, is to um, basically to kind of whet your appetite to, to go and do some more study and more investigation on these subjects. So uh, hopefully that will, uh, will happen in looking at these topics. Well, it worked a minute ago. There we go. So the lessons we'll be looking at over the next four Wednesday nights are, are the following. Um, God and sacrificial offerings, shadows of reality. So another way of expressing that you may be more familiar with is types and any types. Uh, then looking at uh, Messianic prophecies and their fulfillment. And then the uh, fourth one will be obedience of the faithful few. And that will be over the next four weeks. The first three kind of overlap in some of the subjects that we'll be talking about today. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to kind of, kind of blend those three together. And you'll see how that will work when, we, when we're talking about uh, the uh, study of sacrifices in the Bible. But all of these uh, principles that are all these particular principles that are listed here are important and we need to understand them in order to be able to uh, live faithful Christian lives and better appreciate what, what God has done for us. Okay. So the first question is, well, why study this particular topic? Why study, what, what's the significance of, of sacrifices? And there may be a number of things we could talk about that is significant. Uh, these are a couple that uh, stand out in my mind and, and what we want to focus on in our study today. And maybe you haven't thought about it in the, these terms, but when you look at it, is that ever since Adam and Eve sinned, there's been a substitutionary sacrifice that's always been necessary as a part of God's balanced uh, plan uh, or his balanced system of justice and love and this plan was a plan that he conceived before he even created man because when he made man, he knew he was going to make him in his image. He knew he was going to give him free will. And if man has free will, then that means he's able to make the wrong choices as well as make the good choices. So it wasn't a surprise that, that he had to do that. But this substitutionary sacrifice required the shedding of blood. It required the death of the sacrifice. A second uh, uh, major thought here is uh, why I study this is if we think about it that substitutionary sacrifice has always been a part of acceptable worship to God and that's going all the way back to Adam and Eve that sacrifice has always been involved somehow in, in the worship of God and is still involved in the worship of God today because when we partake of the Lord's Supper uh, 
we're remembering the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for our sins. And so hopefully this study will help us to uh, better uh, appreciate that sacrifice and give more significance uh, than maybe it already has uh, to our observance of the Lord's Supper. Because the sacrifice being included in the worship, it, it reminds men of their sins and the need uh, for God to have interposed uh, his life and the life of Christ in order to meet the demand of justice. So we'll talk about that some more in, in a few minutes. But it's important to realize this, that, you know, this just wasn't something that God dreamed up, you know, that there was, it was part of his character that required uh, these, uh, these different things to have to take place in the way that they did. So when we study about the um, topic of sacrifices in the Bible, we see that it reveals a number of important principles, uh, including a number of principles about the, the character of God. We, we get some insights into God and, and how he thinks, what his being is, what his character is. So we see that before Christ died on the cross, that men had to, in, in obeying the commandments of God, they had to offer uh, animals as a substitute sacrifice to suffer a physical death for their own sins. And so that resulted in the frequent killing of animals because one animal wasn't, the death of one animal wasn't applied to a multitude of sins. You know, it was, you know, you sinned, you, you committed a sin, you had to offer a sin offering. And so there was a constant killing of animals. And if we think about that, if we think about that in the Old Testament, and, and uh, next week I want to go into that in a little bit more detail, but if we think about it, every time we committed a sin, we would have to bring, you know, an animal, a goat or a sheep to, to the priest, have, stand there with him, put our hand on his head, watch the priest kill him, then take some of his blood, put it on the altar, put it on various other parts, then drain the blood out of him at the base of the altar and then take his skin and other parts of him and have that burned outside the camp. If we saw that over and over and over and over again, we would kind of get the idea, you know, that, you know, sin is very costly because it just from an animal life standpoint, and I know animal life is not at all comparable to human life, but just from an animal life perspective, Think of how many animals had to die over the course of my life and think of how personal that is standing right there watching the priest kill him, knowing that this was something that God required for me to have my sins forgiven. I wonder if we don't lose sight of that, if we don't, if we don't lose that significance by the Lord's Supper when we partake of that, because that's what we really need to think about when we take of the Lord's Supper is that Christ died one time because he was a sinless human being. So he was the only perfect sacrifice for us. You know, animals are not capable of committing sin. So if they die, it's not like it's a, it's a kind for kind, you know, type of replacement. You know, they're, they're not capable of committing sin. So their blood isn't equivalent to our blood. But do we ever think about that that every time we go to God in prayer and ask him for the forgiveness of sins, the one and only way that it's possible for God to forgive us of those sins is because Christ has died on the cross. So every single time we beg God to forgive us of our wrongdoings, we need to think about, well, this is only possible for me to ask God this because Christ has already paid the penalty for my sins. He's already provided the perfect sacrifice. And so that's what we're supposed to think about when we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Those are the things we're supposed to think about. And if we think about that, if we truly let it sit in, then it will have the, the effect that God wants it to have on us is that it should change our, our life. It should change the way we behave if we, if we really think about that. And so that's, that's something significant there for us to think about. So before Christ died, there was 
probably millions and millions of animals that had to die over the course of, of that period of time as a substitute sacrifice for people. But at the cross, God provided the sacrifice for us one time for the sins of all men, for the sins of men that lived before the cross, the sins of the men that lived during the time of the cross, and for the sins of all men that have lived ever since the cross. That, that sacrifice was for all. And um, it's significant when we think about that, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more but, uh, as we get into the lesson, but under the sacrifices before, before Christ, remember we said, you know, the person had to bring the sacrifice, a priest was involved, at least under the Old Testament covenant. We're not given all the details of how things transpired under the patriarchal age, but certainly there was sacrifices for, for sin. But this was human beings offering sacrifices that could never take away sin. When Christ came, it's God now being the priest. It's God now offering the sacrifice. It's God being the sacrifice for our sins. And so while there's similarities, there's some significant differences. And we, what we need to be impressed with is that the reason all of this transpired is because the sacrifices were necessary for God to be able to implement his balanced system of justice and love. Because justice requires that when a sin is committed, that sin is punished. And we know that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were told that, you know, if they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that if they ate of that, they would die. Talking about physical death. So physical death is the penalty for sin. And yet, if Adam and Eve had physically died at the moment that they sinned, then we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be any other human beings beyond that. And God knew they were going to sin. So he already planned before the creation of man that he would have a way in which he could satisfy this need for justice because he couldn't just ignore it. He couldn't just say, you know, forget about it, which is what we see a lot in our time, you know, where we see people commit crimes and then depending on who they are or, or where, where they're at, what city they're in or what different kinds of circumstances we see, a lot of injustice done where people get off for crimes, but God is not that way. God cannot be truly God if he was biased in his, judge, in his justice. So he had to satisfy justice by having a penalty paid for sins, but at the same time, being a God of love, being a God of mercy, he doesn't want all men to be lost forever. And so he had to have a system whereby both of those key aspects of his character could be satisfied, justice and love and mercy. And he did that himself. He did that through Christ uh, uh, being the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So he's saying human beings could never pay this price because if they crucified me, it would be because I've committed my own sins. So I can't pay the penalty for your sins. And if you were crucified, you couldn't pay the penalty for my sins because you would be dying for your own sins. But it was only Christ who committed those sins, who lived as a human being on earth. That was the only possible sacrifice that will fulfill the need for, for justice and at the same time allow, Christ, allow God to be loving and just and be able to, and merciful to be able to save people from their sins. So it's, it's, uh, it's really significant, it's really sophisticated when you think about it. It's really something that no human being could have dreamed up themselves. So the, the whole scheme of redemption of man points to God as, it, as, its, as its originator. And uh, so that's some significant things that, that we need to think about. And because all men have sinned, as we see in the verses that are listed there, everyone has a need for having their sins forgiven. Now, when we contrast that to the systems of religion that men have conjured up, and you look at the, uh, the religions that were around during the time before Christ, if you look at, the, look at the religions that were around during the time of the Old Testament and so forth, um, they had sacrifices in their religion. 
And that's a whole subject in itself, and it's something I'd like to dive into personally, but we don't have the time to do it. And uh, I didn't prepare for that, but it's something to think about is that when you look at the false religions that men develop, there's a key idea oftentimes that that key idea originated in the true religion of God, and then they've taken that idea and they've perverted it, they've corrupted it. And so you can see that in the idea of sacrifices, that no human being would have dreamed this up on their own, that this is what we need to do in order to be pleasing to God. But when you look at how it was corrupted, the mindset of the people back in the Old Testament days, and even at the time of Christ, was the sacrifices that they offered to their false gods, was they had this concept, well, the gods, the gods plural, are always mad at people. And so we got to do something to appease them. We, we got to do something to get them on our good side. Or the gods just can arbitrarily just be mad at me for some reason. And so I got to do something to, to get them where they're not mad at me anymore. And so a sacrifice is one of the ways I can do that. And so we contrast with that, with the idea that we already talked about, about how the sacrifices that God prepared for us is it wasn't us doing something to say, hey, look at God, you know, for us to say, for God, look at us, see what we're doing, don't be mad at us anymore. It wasn't something we did, because we can never do that. But it was something that God did on behalf of the creatures that he created in his own image. And so there's a very sharp contrast, a very, very different idea there between how the concept of sacrifice was corrupted and how God really intended for it to be in the way it really is. And I think that's uh, some significant things for us to, uh, to think about. So uh, we'll, we'll pause here for a minute and see if anybody's got any questions or comments. If you, if you got anything to say, talk real loud because I'm not that great at hearing. Yes. Hold on, I gotta get closer where I can hear you. I'm sorry. This is a little bit on a tangent. But on the way here, literally, on the way to church tonight, my son goes to me. He goes, If the if Jewish people don't believe in the New Testament, do they still do animal sacrifices? No, they don't. I don't know why. I don't know why. I have no idea. Right. I have no idea. I don't know why other than somehow they have justified it in their mind that they don't need to do that anymore that so, or maybe it's just well, you, a lot you, of that though centered around the temple worship so, right so the sacrifices were done at the temple of course the temple was destroyed in AD 70 as never right and they can't do that so I think that's where a lot of that ended was the sacrifice because they did not sacrifice at the synagogue the, the worship was completely different in the synagogue right. compared to the temple right okay I'm sorry. The Jews today still observe the feast, so stay in their temple. So why couldn't you do the sacrifice? Except for the fact that in the United States, I don't think there would be some legal ramifications, I suppose, for killing the right. church. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But but it is significant, isn't it, that in two thousand years, with all the opportunities that could have been there, they've never rebuilt the temple. And yet, after seventy years of Babylonian captivity, God allowed them to rebuild a temple then, although it wasn't nearly as grand as what it was before the destruction of Jerusalem. So it's telling us that, you know, that this system of religion is no longer the, the accepted religion that God, how God wants us to worship him today. Right. So real quick, we want to look at the, the definition of sacrifice and I don't know if that's something you ever thought about before. You know, when, when we look at the English definitions of sacrifice in the dictionary, you know, we get some slight, you know, we get some different definitions of it that, that don't, they don't seem to focus so much on death as much as the words that are used in the Bible do. Because when you look at the Hebrew words that are used, when you look at the noun and the uh, verbs that are, that are used that are translated as sacrifice, it means to kill. Okay, and it's talking, killing, it's talking about killing of, of the animals that were killed for, for sacrifice. And then when you look at the Greek words that are used in the New Testament that's translated as sacrifice, uh, a similar 
meaning, you know, it comes from the killing either figuratively or, 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 uh, or literally. Uh, it's talking about killing something, uh, either the, the thing that has been killed as to sacrifice or, or the action or the act of killing something. So the, the, the word itself is focused on what we've already talked about is, is, the, is the killing of life as a substitute for the life of someone else whose life is being spared because of this, this sacrifice. So we, uh, 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 I want to look at the question, well, why was the death of a sacrifice required in the first place? Well, as we recall, you know, we've already mentioned in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, you know, when God told Adam and Eve, you know, that they could eat of anything in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that in the day that they did that, they would surely die. And it's, he was talking about physical death, immediate physical death. And we shouldn't be confused and think that, uh, you know, God didn't really mean that because there's other verses here that are listed here that I have here. This is just a few um, where there's similar penalties that if people did certain things and they were to die, talking about immediate uh, physical death. Of course, in Romans chapter two, verse or Romans chapter six, verse twenty-three, it talks about the wages of sin is death, and I, and I know that you know in addition to physical death, that, that's talking about spiritual death as well. But I, I think there's something significant here when we think about you know death as being a. a, a um, a separation, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a separating us from God. It's, if we look at it from those terms, I mean, look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 4, where it says they're talking about the angels that sin, that God didn't spare them, but cast them down to hell and deliver them in the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So, unlike people, it seems that uh, when angels sinned, you know, they were ejected immediately from the presence of God in the hell and because God didn't send his son, God didn't die for the, the souls of angels, but he did for the souls of people. So we're very different in that regard and very significant in that regard. And I think, you know, we need to really uh, uh, think about that and, and see the significant difference there and, and, and appreciate it as, as much as we humanly can because both are creatures of God. Angels didn't create themselves. They're not eternal like God is. They were made by God, but when they sinned, they were cast out. They didn't get a second chance like people do. And so I, I think the key to this, in my, my opinion, the key to this as to why, you know, why death, why God required death as a requirement of sacrifice. I mean, what we're really getting to is why did God say, Adam and Eve, you're going to physically die if you, if you sin? Why was the penalty so severe? And I think it's rooted in the fact that uh, of God's holy character, that when we look at him, that he cannot, he will not allow himself to fellowship or dwell with sin. Sin cannot ever be in his presence. And in Psalm chapter 5, verse 4, he says, for thou art a God that, for thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. So God cannot tolerate sin in his presence. He will not allow it to be in his presence. And so when angels sin, they're removed forever from, from his presence. And when people sin, that would be the consequence of, of that as well. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, he says, But your iniquities have separated. Uh, between you and your God, your sins have hid his face from you that he, that he will not hear. So remember Adam and Eve had close fellowship, close communion with God in the garden before they sinned. And then after they sinned, even though God provided, he interposed his sacrifice for them so that they wouldn't physically die at that moment. He nonetheless drove them out of the garden and they, know, and they didn't have that fellowship that they had before. But God wants to be able to restore that fellowship with people. And so that's why he has the, uh, 
the scheme of redemption that, that he had. Again, God's holy uh, nature, his holy character will not allow him also to be unjust. So God can't just blow off sin. He can't just say, see people when they do wrong, just say, well, forget about it, you know, don't worry about it. That's not in his nature to do that. Psalm 89 verse 14 says, judgment, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. In Exodus 23 verse 7, he says, I will not justify the wicked meaning he's not going to let them off the hook. We know, of course, that if people repent and, and come to him, that he will forgive them. Uh, he goes on to say, well, in Numbers 14, verse 18, similar thoughts. He will by no means clear to the guilty. Nahum 1, verse 3, he will not at all acquit the wicked. So God is not going to ignore sin. Sin demands punishment, and that's part of his nature. Pages are sticking together. Okay. So, since all who sin are under the divine penalty of physical death, then justice requires life for life. So, if our life is to be spared by some sacrifice, then that sacrifice has to involve the death or, or the, the physical death of that sacrifice. And we see a principle that's talked about in Deuteronomy 19, verse 20, where he talks about life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So that's a principle that God uh, laid out there. We also see that, that uh, justice requires the shedding of blood. So it's not just the, the killing of something, but it's also the, the shedding, the, the pouring out of, it, of its blood as a part of that sacrifice is necessary for, for justice. And we learn that in Genesis 9, verse 4, where we learn that life is in the blood. And in Leviticus 17, verse 11, tells us, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for, soul, for the soul. So we see here why there's so much talk in the Bible about about blood because blood represents life. Life is in the blood. So it's, it's emphasizing the, the shedding of life in return for you to be able to keep your life. It's the emphasis there. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Talking about there's no remission of, of sins. So that brings us to the la last question that we got. We want to look at uh, tonight is when was the first sacrifice made for sin? And if we look in Genesis chapter three and read verses one through twenty-one, uh, we can see when that uh, that first sacrifice was offered. And it doesn't tell us explicitly. But if we read between the lines, if, if we infer certain things, then we can uh, see how that was the case. Now, we don't have time to read all of those uh, verses, and we're all familiar with uh, the story there. But um, just remember, you know, that when Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate the fruit they shouldn't have, you know, God calls them, he, um, God confronts them on their, on their sin, and there's a, a series of conversations there about that and we see in verse uh, 7 of chapter 3 it says and at, talks about after they sinned it says the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened and they knew that they were naked now that physically happened and I don't know what God did to cause their mindset to change where they come to that realization but I, I think there's also kind of a a, um, a symbolic uh, message that's there as well because they saw themselves as being they, they, they realized they needed some physical covering and they were shame, ashamed of how they stood they, they were shamed in their condition I'm not sure they were at the point yet where they were ashamed of the actual sin that they committed but by them all of a sudden realizing they're naked they felt shame they felt the need for covering so what did they do they went out and made clothes they made aprons out of fig leaves 
that we learned that those fig leaves weren't adequate for the job because later on we find out that God did what? He, made, he clothed them with skins. Okay? Now, think about that for a minute. Out of all the things God could have clothed them with, why animal skins? And if you clothe somebody with the skin of an animal, what has to happen to the animal before you take the skin off of him? He's got to die. So there's an implied interpositioning here at that very moment. You know, you ask, well, why did Adam and Eve not die immediately when they sinned? It's because at that moment, God began implementing his plan with inter... I can't say the word. Inter interposing an animal for their life as a symbol of Christ who would be the ultimate sacrifice who would be interposed for our, for our life. So it's life for life. In order for you to continue to live, in order for me to be just, this animal's got to die. And that's implied by the, the animal skins. And I think, it's very, I think it's very significant when you look at these verses. You know, in the Psalm chapter 32, verse 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. In the Psalm 85, verse 2, it talks about God as forgiving his sins, forgiving the sins of the people as covering their sin. In 1 Peter 4, verse 8, it talks about love will co cover a multitude of sins, meaning that if we love people, we will do what James says to do in James chapter 5, verse 20. We'll try to convert them away from the error of their way. We'll try to turn them away from that error of the way. And so doing, what will we do? We'll cover their sins. We'll hide a multitude of sins. So covering sins is, is a way of saying God has forgiven those sins. So in my opinion, when we look at God covering, when God is clothing Adam and Eve, there's kind of a twofold message there. Yes, he's saying the clothes you made physically did not, were not adequate to, to provide decent coverage for you. So, yeah, I'm making you physical coverings that are modest. But the other part of it is, is I'm providing a cover for your sins because the animals I had to kill to provide these skins, these clothes of skin for you are the substitute or a substitute for you forfeiting your life. And so I think it's very significant when we think about that. So from the very beginning of man sinning is when sacrifices came into play. And uh, we'll stop here and think about that for a minute and see if you got any questions or comments you want to make. I think that's a significant point or significant points to think about. Okay. Well, the last point I want to emphasize that too is, is look at the physical coverings that they made were not adequate. And we know from a spiritual standpoint, there's nothing a human being can ever do that's going to be adequate to be able to cover our sins so that God is indebted to us to forgive us of our sins. So I think there's some, some significance to that, uh, that, to that as well. Is it required God to provide the adequate covering for them, just like he was going to do several thousand years later where he provided the adequate covering for all men by, all, by again, he's provided his own sacrifice. He did the own killing himself in order for men to be able to have their sins forgiven. I mean, when you think about things like that, you know, it's, it's uh, if, um, I want to say if you're a deep thinker, but I don't want to, I don't want to imply that you're not a deep thinker. So I don't know, I don't know a different way of saying that. So don't think I'm trying to insult you, but I'm just saying these are really deep thoughts if you, if you think about it, you know, and so you can, you can dive as deep as you want to in God's word and you never can get to the bottom of it because his, his, his word is just so much deeper than what we're humanly capable of absorbing everything. And so that's, that's really something that's there. It's really significant.
So when we think about this, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this more uh, later. Uh, we, we can think about that in terms of types and any types, you know, that the physical covering versus the spiritual covering, the animal sacrifice versus the, you know, Christ being the, the ultimate sacrifice, um, the inability of man to be able to provide his own adequate covering for himself and man, God having to provide it for him. Uh, lots of uh, different parallels there. And then we look at the uh, verse 15 of Genesis chapter 15, which we, we, or Genesis chapter 3, which we, we skipped over. But let's, let's spend a, we got 11 minutes, so let's spend a, little, a few minutes looking at that. And this is dealing into obviously the subject of messianic uh, prophecy. But it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, you could spend a lot of time on this and still wouldn't be able to get all of the information that uh, we could get out of it. But uh, a couple of years ago, we studied this on uh, Sunday morning. So, so just in summary, we'll just uh, read a couple of uh, summary thoughts from that, that lesson. It says, uh, Genesis 3, verse 15, is a prophecy with a double meaning or application. One meaning of the enmity between woman and her seed and the serpent and his seed refers to the opposition the spiritual war between those who live in sin, referring to the followers of Satan, and those who are faithful servants of God. This opposition, you know, will exist until the, the end of time. A second meaning of the uh, prophecy refers to a conflict between Christ and Satan. So as in the literal case of a snake and a human, the snake crawling on the ground is only able to strike at the heel and not the head. The human being, being more powerful and larger, can step on the snake's head. The serpent will try to triumph over deity, but will only be able to bruise the heel of Christ through his suffering, crucifixion, and death. Christ, being God in the flesh, bruised the head of the serpent by being the blood sacrificed to reconcile all men back to God who accept his conditions of reconciliation. Christ was the first to conquer death by his resurrection and free those from the power of sin. And so a third thought that's also uh, we, we get from here is um, it's the, the idea is that, well, obviously all people, the existence of people wasn't going to end, that God was going to provide a way to be able for people to be able to be reconciled to him. And so the human race wasn't going to end at that, that particular time. And so uh, we, we, um, we, we see that being discussed or being implied in, in these particular verses. And like I said, we could spend a, a whole lot more time talking about that. But we also see in Genesis chapter 3 that uh, in order for God to cover a person's sin, that they must have the right attitude. They must repent and accept God's condition for repentance because as we learn in James chapter 5, verse 20, and of course there's other verses we could look at that that discuss the same principle, is that the sinner must turn or the sinner must convert from his sinful way and come to God in order for his sins to be hidden or, or to have his sins covered. We see that also in Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17, where it says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So again, these verses are not saying, you know, that God doesn't require sacrifice for, for sin, to have people's sins forgiven. But what he's saying is that it's more to it than that. It's not just you can bring a sacrifice to me and still have the same attitudes you have about the wrongs that you've done and, and you, there's no repentance on your part. You can, if you do that, you're just going to be uh, killing an animal, just like, you know, when we're uh, are immersed for the remission of our sins. You know, if we don't come repentant to God, then well, we just got wet. It's no different, you know, than diving in a swimming pool or diving into the ocean. We got wet, but there's no significance to it because we didn't have the right attitude about it. We didn't have the penitent heart. We didn't have the broken and contrite spirit that David talks about here in Psalm 51. And so 
We asked, well, did Adam and Eve have a broken and contrite heart? Is there any indication that they changed? Well, when we look at um, Genesis chapter 3 and do some more, more digging, we'll note that in verse uh, 20, it talks, it says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Note that the that God gives us that information before he tells us that he clothed them with coats of skins. My opinion is, I think that's significant. By Adam saying that Eve is the mother of all living, he gives her that name. What does that imply? What, what does that suggest about Adam's mindset? Remember, God had just given Adam a prophecy about Christ. He didn't give him a lot of details, but he gave him some. And he told him about, you know, the seed of woman coming and the seed of woman was going to bruise the, the head of Satan. So with that limited amount of information, you know, there's not a whole lot we can tell from it, but we know that more information was given later on as God revealed more information. But do we not see an Adam saying that I'm going to call my wife Eve because she's going to be the mother of all living. God just told him that there was going to be a seed of woman that was going to do this. Now, if Adam didn't believe God, why would he have said that? Why would he have called his wife Eve the mother of all the living? Didn't it imply, didn't it imply that, one, I understand that the human race is going to continue on for some period of time until this seed comes along that God promised would come through a woman. Doesn't it imply that? Huh? He, believed God. he believed to the degree that he was able to with the information that he was given, he believed God. Right. And then we see a similar thing. We see a similar acceptance of God in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where uh, Adam and Eve, they have Cain, and, and, and Eve gives God all the credit where he says, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Okay, well, in order for Eve to be the mother of all living, she had to have some babies, did she not? So by her crediting God for this son that she's got, she's giving God the credit for that. To the degree that I'm capable of understanding from the information that you've given me, I've accepted this promise also. And I, and I, I think that's significant because he brings that out before he talks about him clothing them with skins. Yes. Well, Right. But because they continued, that, and, and they, as you mentioned, they spoke to the Lord, but I, I think there, it would have been an end to mankind had they not repented. Exactly. So our Bible would have been significantly shorter. There wouldn't have been, yeah, there wouldn't have been a Bible. But that's, that's correct. Because what we talked about about God's nature, we know that he doesn't forgive people who will not repent, who will not turn to him. There has to be a change of heart in order for there to be forgiveness. And that wasn't going to happen until Adam and Eve changed their heart, and their heart did change. Right. So I don't, I don't think it's wrong to infer certain things that are clearly keeping within the characteristic of God. Right. So. Right. Otherwise, we couldn't infer that. If it wasn't right. consistent with God's characteristics, then our, we'd have to conclude our inference is wrong. Right. Agreed. So last slide, this is one of the few classes I actually get to my last slide. <laughs> so for, future stu for further study, these are mentions of other sacrifices being offered before the law of Moses was given, before a written law was given. That does not mean at all that these are the only people that offered sacrifices. This is just the only times that they're, they're mentioned in the Bible that sacrifices were given. And as we see later in chapter four, we read about Cain and Abel. We read about Noah offering a sacrifice after the flood, all of which begged the question, well, why did they do this? Why did they do that? Well, obviously God gave them verbal instructions as to 
to do, how to do it, when to do it, why they needed to do it. We just don't have that all recorded. And so uh, I, I differ a little bit from the, the comment that the, the author makes in, in his book where he, he, he kind of infers, well, sacrifices, it doesn't seem like they were that commonplace uh, before the, the giving of the law. And I, I would just emphasize, and I, I know that's maybe a, a common mistake that a lot of people make, but we have to think about there's a lot of time that elapsed from the creation until the giving of the law of Moses, and God doesn't give us all the details on that. He gives us very little details on it. And so just because God chose not to give us a lot of details about something doesn't mean that that, that wasn't the case because we're not told in the Old Testament that Abel was a prophet. But in Luke, Luke tells us in the New Testament, he infers that Abel was a prophet because he talks about, you know, the, the prophets being killed, you know, beginning from Abel up to the, the name of uh, Zechariah, I believe it was. So he lists him among the prophets. We don't know that Enoch was a prophet until we read about Jude, and he tells us that Enoch was a prophet. So there were always spokesmen for God during this time, even though we don't have, even though there wasn't a written law at this time. There was obviously an unwritten law. Otherwise, God couldn't have held people responsible for, for doing what's right and for, not, and for not doing those things that are wrong. So I say all that to say that I, I think we've established when the first sacrifice was, and we've established that there was going to be a constant need for sacrifices until Christ came along. And even then, there's still a need for sacrifice. It's just there's not a constant need for animal sacrifices like there was before Christ. So we'll stop there. Uh, next week, we'll talk about the subject of uh, types and antitypes, and, and we're going to weave into that some more discussion about the, the uh, different types of offerings by trying to get into the Old Testament law where it gives more details about the sacrifices. So.